Welcome and good morning to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 564. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Tuesday, the 7th of January, 2020. All right, welcome to another year, another show, and we're doing Anglican Unscripted again. Before we get started, I have some instructions for you viewers out there, both ladies and gentlemen, laity and clergy alike, maybe some children, that'd be great too if we have a younger audience, but according to the statistics on uh, YouTube, you're all 65 or 65 plus. That's fine. That's, that's my demographic. I'll work with it. Let's talk a little bit about your responsibility. That is to share the program, uh, spread the word. This is a growing program. We're getting you know more and more viewers every week, and we appreciate that. Uh, you also need to like the program because it helps with the algorithms at Facebook and YouTube. Uh, adds us higher in the search engine results. Comment. This show continues each week in the comments. Once I... Uh, click the uh, stop button here and I upload it. It goes onto YouTube and there's a whole page where you can put all the comments. Some of you correct us, we appreciate that. Some of you uh, add to the, the discussion, we appreciate you, that. Some of you guys are sort of way off topic and that's called trolling. Don't do that, we don't like trolling. Also, you're gonna see a little red button up there. It's a rectangle that says subscribe. If it's still red, it means you've not subscribed yet. This is your opportunity as a faithful viewer to finally get updates of when new episodes come out by clicking the subscribe button and then a little bell will come up. Click the bell and YouTube will graciously send you quick updates every time I upload a new episode. Show notes. I'm going to do this early on in the show today. Um, I got several emails since... Uh, uh, Gavin Ashton announced he's going to give up his ministry and join the uh, Roman Catholic Church, saying, why is Gavin Ashton still on your program? He is no longer an Anglican. You are very observant. Gavin Ashton is no longer an Anglican. And I'm going to tell you this as an editor, producer, and host of uh, Anglican Unscripted. Here's how I look at it. I am probably one of the foremost top 20 Microsoft uh, experts in Connecticut. I run a successful company. We help uh, with uh, viruses at the network level, security. If your IT professional, your company quit and locked you out of everything uh, by not giving you the password, I could have you back in in 10 minutes. That's the level of expertise I offer in Microsoft. However, I do not use Microsoft products. I use Apple. Gavin is an expert in Anglicanism, yet he does not use the product. And that's <laughs> that's kind of how I look at this as the, as the host. Why am I keeping uh, Gavin on? Because currently he's still an expert, uh, and he has Q, we'll talk about that later, uh, on Anglicanism. Anglicanism, and I, I need that on the program, even though he's, uh, as George and I sometimes quip, change teams or got the ugly girlfriend. So um, am, am I right in my thinking, George? Well, yes, uh, but uh, unlike Gavin, unlike Apple, uh, does not rely on Chinese slave labor for manufacturing his opinion. <laughs> <Doesn't>. um, <laughs> Although, <laughs> get, uh, geez, go dirty no, there. Oh, <laughs> no, but no, but I mean, in my in my little head, I think of Gavin as an anonymous Anglican. He just oh. doesn't know it. <laughs> but uh, in the in God's providence and mercy, he too one day at the beatific vision will realize, darn, I just picked the wrong door. No, but no, God I, will lead him into salvation nevertheless. I was talking to a good friend about this, and I said, you know, I'm hoping uh, Gavin is the steps that uh, reunite uh, Roman Catholicism and Anglicanism in the future, because um, I really don't know uh, what God holds out. But I don't want to be the guy who tried to stop God in this and, and uh, throw a monkey wrench in it. Uh, so, Gavin, you're still on the program, and that means you have to continue to study up, continue to be an Anglican insider. If somebody offers you a tip, don't reply, oh, I'm no longer an Anglican, to the email. 
Just keep <laughs> keep the information coming. And uh, uh, you are a valued member of Anglican Unscripted. One day in the future, we may change the, uh, the name of the program. Currently, we're Anglican Unscripted. But I was thinking, I wouldn't do ecumenical unscripted. That wouldn't do it. But somebody said Catholic, Roman Catholics and uh, Anglicans that are doing what we're doing are evil, George. Yes, this is a fun little story. Antonio Spadaro, who's the editor of La Civita Cattolica, the Jesuit publication published by the uh, province of Rome of the Jesuits, semi-official, its editorial line is approved by the Pope. He tweeted on uh, January 1st after President Trump gave a, a speech at a Hispanic evangelical rally. And he tweeted a link saying, look at this article I wrote in 2017 that the Pope has approved and thinks is wonderful. And in this article, Spadaros talks about the ecumenism of hatred. Conservat and it's looking at the English-speaking world. Conservative evangelicals and traditionalist Catholics are forming together to combat the truth and light and goodness and joy of the Francis Project and I guess the Welby Project and other and the Catherine Difford Shorey product project. So the access of evil is, I guess, Gavin is going to be disappointed that by leaving the Anglican world, he is no longer off the enemies list. He's just moved from enemy A list to enemy B list. He's still on the shit list for the right thinking people of this world. I think that Spadano article is very good, and it it it's although he's got good and evil the wrong way around, and hatred and love the wrong way around. I think he's recognised that we live in the twenty first century with a new theological and spiritual configuration, and actually the three of us do represent an alliance, a, a holy alliance. Maybe we should just call ourselves the Magi, Magi unscripted, the three wise men. I'm sure one of them was Orthodox, one Catholic and one Anglican. But anyway, with being unable to prove that, um, uh, I, I think there's a lot to be said for our representing this new axis of the kingdom of heaven in collaboration with each other. And I'm quite glad Spodano has pointed it out, even if he thinks he's on the right side, whereas we pray for his repentance. Stay tuned for evil unscripted. And I like it. I just, you know, it, it would have that more, more flair in the name and uh, maybe more viewership. Um, but that article kind of transitions into uh, the, the three billion ways to Jesus or the three billion ways to heaven. Church Times editorial put out his uh, uh, epiphany article and I read it and I said, he just made unscripted. This is going to be something good to talk about because he suggests that there's more ways uh, to heaven than just the way of Christ. And I thought, George, you probably read the article. What do you think? Well, it was the January 4th, last Friday's issue for the Epiphany in the Church Times. And it talked about the uh, gift of the Magi and and all that. And it's not signed. It's so it represents the opinion of the uh, edit, of the newspaper. And in the past, people like Martin Percy and other leading lights of the progressive wing of the Church of England have written their editorials. It's not only the work of the editor in chief, Paul Handley, sometimes is, but not exclusively. So we can't say who that he is or she is. However, it is the word of the Church Times. The Church Times has joined the sea of faith movement now many most people will not be familiar with that but the sea of faith movement arose in the late 70s out of the work of people like don cupid and other uh post-christian anglicans it's very strong in places like south africa and parts of the church of england and scotland and and catherine jeffrey shore is a devotee of this and the specifics and i'll just if i may read part of the editorial and I hope we have a link to the editorial in our little notes to the program so you can read it yourselves. But let me just uh, quickly just read a few snatches to see what we're talking about. The story of the Epiphany invites the church to go one further. The involvement of the Magi, presumed to be Zoroastrian, certainly non-Jews, and the account of the Incarnation, and an event of unparalleled holiness and mystery is a reminder that Christ did not come into the world to save Christians. The editorial goes on to say, remember Pope John Paul gathering faith leaders in Assisi 
and how wonderful it was that the Vedas, the Sutras, the Qurans, the Avesta were all heard in the Sitsi along with the Psalms and the Gospel. And then it concludes with its argument, its point. It is a constant failing of the church, perhaps even a blasphemy, a blasphemy to overlook the works of the Spirit that are performed through non-Christians of every shade. The fruit of the Spirit, as enunciated by St. Paul, love, joy, peace, and so on and so forth, are manifested in all people of goodwill. And at the basic level, the prayers of the church should mirror the wideness of the sea, see your faith time, by encompassing all who suffer in the coming year for their pursuit of justice and mercy. So what do we have here? Jesus is not the only way to the Father. Church, you know, the aim of life is justice and mercy. It's not, where to begin, Gavin? Where do you begin with something? Like, it's not new. Well, but no, it, I, I, I would in being an editorial, the official flagship editorial view of the Church Times. Let, let me give uh, Gavin a good primer. According to this article, and certainly I've read the Quran many times, jihad is a fruit of the spirit of the uh, of the Quran, and so I I don't understand how the Church Times can come at this. Such a thing can only be written by, we'll have to call them the once born. Because one of the things that happens when you're born again or born from above is you enter into a dynamic that the Zoroastrians would have been very familiar with. You enter into a great spiritual struggle. You encounter real evil and you begin to notice what real evil is uh, as a counterpart to the real good you meet in Jesus. Um, I think it's a uh, very likely that at least one or if not all three of the wise men were Zoroastrians. And the great gift of Zoroastrianism is because, because other religions do have gifts. They have gifts and they have flaws. The great gift is that it understands human life in terms of a struggle between very serious evil and good, very serious darkness and light, as John did. But what it doesn't understand is that the battle is won by goodness. And either a lot of people today whose experience of the world is so dark and problematic experience of themselves is so difficult that they wonder if 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 god is good or if the mind behind the universe is sadistic jesus tells us that the mind is good kind and compassionate so jesus takes the insights of zoroastrianism affirms them expands them and redefines them and you could say the same thing was true of buddhism buddhism has some some very notable and worthwhile things in it it has a sense of universal uh, universal morality, which it calls karma. It reminds people of the importance of not being uh, imprisoned by their own appetites, but it has no no description or encounter with a god or with the human soul or, or the self, which it defines as ignorance, evil is ignorance. So there are things that Jesus can affirm that the Buddhists got to first, but he has to redefine what is true in that. And the problem with the with the this this list of love joy peace patience kindness goodness and self-control which is being used by the liberals it's exactly the platform that got me into my ethical pluralism when i became an lgbt uh, uh supporter as a christian because i began to mistake as they do uh, a form of of narcissistic um narcissistic deception really uh a kind of a kind of Pelagianism. If I am patient today, or kind, or loving, on a scale of what God knows, what 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 do they imagine the scale is that we we then measure one another by? Uh, then this must be an act of the Holy Spirit. But the Zoroastrians would have pointed out that evil masquerades as good all the time, uh, and all Christians who have lived life of serious prayer do so with a very with a very sensitive grasp that we may mistake evil for good because evil pretends. The only way in which you could have written this is if you were once born, if you had no experience of spiritual struggle. St. Paul uh, could never have written Romans 7 if he believed in this editorial in the Church Times because what he discovered there was, a, was a, an enormous struggle between part of his old self and his new self, part of his corrupt self and his being redeemed self. Only when you've been twice born can you get into this and recognize this new geography of the spirit that the Gospels talk about. And the editor of the Church Times has no idea what he's talking about. He's being religious. Uh, he may be religiously well-informed, politically sophisticated, but he doesn't know anything about the kingdom or the Gospel. 
And, and that's one of the differences between us and those who push a more inclusive, relativistic sexual ethic. What they don't understand is the whole training of the Bible is to distinguish sacred from profane. And it's this, this distinction, this division that Jesus brings that is at the heart of the kingdom. Jesus does not come to unite everything. He comes, as he said, to divide. Well, I better stop, stop the thing now. But anyway, George, you're absolutely right. Thank you for presenting it, because it's the great deceit of our time, theologically, to make us all ethical relativists. No, it's true. I mean, there's no point in the incarnation, there's no point in the resurrection, there's no point in the Holy Spirit if there are so many ways to get to uh, to heaven. And I think uh, um, the Church Times really misses the point to use the epiphany as a declaration of uh, everybody gets in. And I don't think the author is reading the same Bible that I'm reading. Um, you know, it's quite clear that Jesus said the only way to the Father is through me. And this, so I don't want to say silly mistakes because they're, I'm sure this person is deeply, profoundly educated, but I think as Gavin would say that they have not experienced the fullness of grace, uh, that numinous uh, aspect of, Jesus, of faith in Jesus Christ. Well, for instance, they conflate the, the the comforts of grace, the gifts that God gives all people with the fruits of the Spirit. They're not the same thing. Um, God gives humanity to all people. And God led the Magi, uh, he, you know, he had, through the gift of grace, the Gentile, the Zoroastrian Magi, was led to Christ. And, there's, there's, and it's even, not he, he was not bringing his Zoroastrianism to Christ. He was led, being led from that into fullness of relationship with the Lord. I was very embarrassed when I was a young law student about the claims of Christianity. And I remember when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And how, how on earth am I going to defend this? Because it sounds so exclusive. But the, the theological answer is, is simplicity itself. There is no father in Buddhism. There is no father in Islam. There is no father in Zoroastrianism. There is no father in Greek rationality, the main, the main competitive religions. There is no father in atheism. If you want to get to the father, only Jesus shows us the father. No, the reason he is the only way is because no other religion has the father. They wouldn't, wherever they're taking you to, it wouldn't be him. And so, so it is not a matter of Jesus being exclusive and everything else being relativistic. It's simply a matter of describing the goal that Jesus takes us to. Not only does he take us to the Father where no one else knows who he is, but of course we couldn't stand in front of the Father unless we were washed in the blood of Christ. And, and, and I mean, imagine for a moment that, that, that our thoughts got put onto YouTube and, and, and people could see what's inside our heads. I, I, could, I wouldn't last 10 seconds without being overwhelmed and broken by shame and embarrassment. And now, what do, th what do we think is going to happen when the nuclear holiness of the Father uh, exposes us for who we really are? We won't, we won't stand it for a second. Only the blood of Christ can allow us to stand in front of nuclear holiness. Um, the, the idea that we could, we could and, and actually I know this because, because I had an out-of-body experience where I was led to judgment. And one of the things that makes me, uh, I wish I don't want to go on about, although I am writing a book in which I'm going to describe it, to describe my path into the fullness of faith, brothers join me. Um, but meanwhile, um, the, the, there is no sense of, of what judgment is going to be like or, or the reality and the forensic nuclear holiness of the Father. If people had any sense of that, they would never talk this relativistic nonsense. They would instead depend and look to Jesus because without him there is there is no standing before the Father at judgment. If I may sort of piggyback onto what you say, Gavin, and, and I do want you to help me make sure I say what you say. I'm taking it in the right direction, you're running it. Um, no, I don't think any of us are saying that uh, good manners, kindness, uh, compassion, can only be found in the Christian. I don't think any of us would even make that claim. Not even close, yeah. But what I think what we're saying about the Christian is that the the path that we're being led to is not ultimately kindness, compassion, or justice. It's into relationship with the Father. Um, the, there was an editorial, uh, not an editorial, Mark Strange, the primus of the Scottish Episcopal Church, released a New Year's message. And I felt compelled to publish it on the Anglican Inc. because it, for me, epitomized 
I don't want to say what was wrong, but what he didn't understand. And in his edit, and in his New Year's message, he said the first priority of the Scottish Episcopal Church in 2020 is climate change. Oh, thank God! I was worried that it would be something real. And and I'm not. And and see, this is not an argument about man-made uh, changes to the atmosphere, either for or against it, but rather the first priority of a Christian, I mean, especially of a Christian minister or a priest or what have you is to bring people in right is to be in right relationship with the father and bring other people to him and so when the church times says you know all people of goodwill can seek justice yes that's true on a certain mundane level and i say mundane not to be dismissive but rather the true imperative of life is that relationship with god it's I like to listen to the radio when I drive around and visit my parishioners, and we have Christian radio stations in Florida all over the place. And one man I listen to is a Presbyterian, a Scots Presbyterian named Alistair Begg. And I don't know if this is his original to him, but Alistair Begg uh, had a comment that uh, for him, uh, it is better that one per soul be saved and have a relationship with Jesus Christ than all the social wrongs of the world be fixed. And I know that sounds extreme, and people can quibble about that. Well, if we fix poverty and justice, this, that, then more people come to Christ? Maybe. But I still think Beg is on to something when our first call as ministers, as Christians, is to bring people in relationship with the Father. I'm sure that's right. And the reason it is better for one soul to be reconciled to God is because all souls will face judgment. We, we live, especially in the 20th and 21st century, as though we're not going to die. But I mean, a good number of my friends have died, and when I go to bed every night, I say to myself, "This may be it. I may, my my next encounter may be with the Father in judgment. I better, I, I better make sure <laughs> I've done everything I can to present myself to Him." And I think it's this 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 really uh, seriously flawed consumerist attitude to life that we have a right to it, almost a kind of an existential affirmation of the Greek notion the soul gets a right to eternal life all by itself. Um, but actually, the Hebrew understanding is that we, we, we are only given life by God. It's lent, it's provisional, and we'll have to answer, and we won't be able to answer on our own terms. We need the blood of Jesus. We need forgiveness. So all the all, if you put everything right in the world, all the justices and feed everybody, they're still going to die. And when they die, they'll need to be saved and in relationship with the Father. Kevin, you on your Facebook page posted the monologue from the Golden Globes, where this British atheist, <laughs> reading named Ricky Gervais, who's uh, I'm not that familiar with popular culture, but. Uh, I have seen him in many things. I find him enjoyable. He is an atheist. He's very liberal, progressive culturally and all this and that. But he had a remark saying to the Hollywood glitterati, you're all going to die and there's no second act. There's so you no better get it right today. Yeah. Now, to me, that was probably the most profound theological thing I heard on public <laughs> media from an atheist comedian, a pasty-faced atheist comedian from the UK. Well, it, to, uh, my answer to the Scottish and my answer to Hollywood is uh, found in Scripture. If you're looking for what to seek for your province, for Hollywood, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We always tend to complicate the simple. We do that as theologians. We do that as uh clergy, laity, bishops, uh, and archbishops. And I find it time and time again, we want to identify the earth as being in charge. We have to uh, keep the earth happy. No, we need to seek the kingdom. We need to make that our primus and uh, not all the things surrounding it. And this goes to what Gavin said earlier in the show, that the battles within Christianity really are not the issues of the 16th century. There are the issue, you know, we have a new enemy and that Gavin and I may disagree on in what order you get to salvation, sola scriptura or the magisterium or tradition, or all that, in other, but we all agree that they all, they all can, the same things are on both of our lists. We just mm -hmm. may order them differently. And that is a very different disagreement 
than the disagreement we have with the Marxist, secularist, humanist worldview. I have something we yeah. can have fun with. Let's transition. Now, I think every president has said this at one point or the other. God is on our side. God will help us win this war. We are on the side of righteousness. We are coming up against the evil, evil access, yeah, the Cold War, call it what you want. Uh, but at some point or another, when you want to uh, get people on your side, you say God is on our side. Trump, as re recently as last week, uh, gave a, a speech somewhere sometime uh, right after he uh, bombed the heck out of an a, a Iranian general and said God is on our side. And I thought this would be fun to talk about. It's going to take hours, but you guys got 20 minutes. Uh, well, I, I, I can summarize it. He's right. Do you want he's to move right. to the next question? <laughs> Moving on. Next topic. No. <laughs> but, you know, it, we, as a Western culture, uh, sometimes do things absolutely wrong, and we say God is on our side. Sometimes we actually do something right, and we say God is on our side. When is God on our side, George? Oh, do it, do it, do it, do it, you want to do it, give me 20 theology. minutes to answer this? <laughs> yeah, you got 20 minutes. Come on. I, I'd rather stay in the weeds, Kevin, and say <laughs> that uh, President Trump gave this to a meeting of Hispanic evangelicals down in South Florida. Mm -hmm. And the uh, 7,000 people uh, went wild because of... Uh, well, the funny thing is many, many uh, liberal Christians or Christians who dislike Donald Trump as a person, they think he's vulgar, they think he's this, that, the other, uh, say, well, why would these people respond to calls to faith, calls to God from a notorious sinner? Well, I jokingly told, said in the pre-show that, well, being a Calvinist is helpful because everybody is is uh, evil, uh, <laughs> evil, and evil. Uh, uh, you know it, it's just we're just now separating by degrees. But for what Trump is saying resonates within American culture, with American history, and also within American Christianity that God has set the United States as a nation upon a hill, going back to the Mayflower Compact, going back all that time that we are a nation set apart by God. Now, of course, that's a whole theological can of worms that I don't want to get no, it is, into. And, yeah. But the, but the, well, let me just sort of move it slightly. Um, Alan Dershowitz, the retired Harvard Law School professor, who I, who's very fun to watch. He's very mm -hmm. combative and he's fabulously intelligent. Uh, he basically laid out that why this, according to international law, American law, all this and that, ordering the assassination of a uh, commander of the Iranian army engaged in uh, terrorist acts that have killed over a thousand plus American troops was lawful, proportionate, and just. And some Christians are saying that, you know, drone warfare or kidding back at your enemy like this uh, is not lawful, it's not proportionate, it's not just. So there's an argument in some circles over just war theory. There's a political argument that whatever president President Trump does must be wrong. Therefore, the opposite is right. Um, but there's so much packed in this, Kevin. I don't know how to answer. Is God with the United States other than saying yes? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, think, I mean, I think it's one of the questions that that is problematic because it covers up the real question. Uh, it's an attractive question, and therefore one's tempted to answer it. But actually. Like so many questions, we should say, this is not something I'm going to answer. Let's, let's try and find a better question. Because as George so, so beautifully said, uh, there's a distinction between, first of all, who we are and what do we do. So, you know, the, what do we do is, were well, we justified in taking these, these political acts in wiping out a violent man? And then who are we anyway? Because, there's the, you know, the Southern Baptists are not the same as the Hollywood glitterati. So how can you say is God on, you know, on our side? But I think the question is better put if we say, are we on God's side? And then, because that's the question our society should be asking. Are we on God's side in the struggle uh, in human affairs? And that raises up a whole lot of questions about whether we can tell the difference between good and evil ourselves and whether or not it's not God who needs to change his mind, but we who need to change. And so I think I think I want to say to any government or any government leader who said this, well, are you on God's side? And I have 
to, I would like to say that I'm very impressed with the way in which Trump has stood up for the unborn, because on that on that platform, he appears to me to be more on God's side than many other people. I was quite impressed by the way he sought the prayers of Christians. I rather liked the way his face changed as they prayed for him. I thought something good is happening. And by allowing Christians to pray, pray for him, I thought Trump was taking one more step uh, towards the place where one could say he's on God's side. Now, how much of the rest of Trump is on God's side? I have no idea. That's a question Trump needs to ask. But the, one of the things I'd like to do for my government is say, to what extent are you on God's side? And I, my answer would be in, in the UK, hardly at all. So you can't expect God to be on your side. Well, it's the same here in America. America is not seeking the kingdom first. The government is not seeking the kingdom first. Trump, and I, the, I'm judging for a second, does not seem to be seeking the kingdom first. But you're right. He's done an amazing thing. He has finally brought uh, the pro-life movement back to level ground after you know, some 28, 30 years of being on, on, on even ground. The, he's staffed the federal courts again with conservatives or people who believe in the Constitution again. He's done some amazing things. From my simple perspective, he is an extremely flawed character, but I don't listen to those who say to me, Kevin, he's so flawed because you made me put up with Bill Clinton and you told me he was not flawed. He was just a character. Well, if Bill Clinton is a character, then Trump is just a character. And if you were willing to live with Bill Clinton's uh, uh, flaws, I'm willing to live with Trump's, Trump's flaws. And but, but he, he, and here's that, that's that's quite right. If I may just quickly jump in, no, I'd like ahead. to tie yeah, what sure. you just said with with what what George was saying earlier about you know contrasting one person's salvation with putting all the wrongs in the world right. The point is, you you we can't we do not know what the right political ethic, ethically political moves are in terms of global warming, for example. There are lots of people who are saying by by destroying our industrial and carbon based society, we remove from ourselves all the power to uh, to to produce a level of in, ingenious new invention with which we can change our living patterns. But we don't do that by putting ourselves back into the middle ages. The, the problem with finding reducing hunger, producing justice is if you don't change human nature, you, you won't produce uh, justice and the ending of hunger and the sharing of resources. One of the reasons of being a Christian is that, that only by transforming human nature can you transform human politics. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've been very uh, unwilling to enter into political debate as far, as far as I can, because my own sense of my own lack is that only by Christian transformation will my political life be improved in any way at all. And therefore, once again, if you start with the given that nothing changes our political priorities, is God on our side? That's again a dreadful piece of, of narcissism, and utterly bereft of any spiritual insight, and therefore we shouldn't be asking that question. I agreed. Well, if, if I may just take this in a slightly bit different direction, the Chinese Communist Party recently <clears throat> released a 10,000 character um, statement on morality and ethics. Because the Chinese, because basically they they are engaged in all-out war with Christianity, in Islam and organized religion, uh, in the far west of China it's Islam, in the major cities of the east it's Christianity. Christian ministers being arrested, the Ten Commandments are being replaced by the uh, uh, Communist Party principles, and the, the, they're not just. Uh, it's not akin to, say, in Mexico 100 years ago, an anti-clericism, where we're basically trying to destroy the power of the church for political purposes. Rather, we're trying to change the nature of humanity by giving them a new ethic that, yeah. that allows the, uh, us well, to remain in power. So that th this ethic that the Chinese communists are putting out, uh, it's the same program that the Ricky Gervais was lampooning the Hollywood elite about. It's the same program that the Church Times, I'm not saying the Church Times editorial board are Chinese communists, uh, I, but I am saying that they're on the same trajectory. They're on the same wavelength, which is walking away from the Father, seeking to create the idols of mankind as the center of all being. 
whether you call that idle justice, whether you call that uh, wealth, whether you call that social harmony, if it's not based on the Father, it's a false idol. It's flawed, I believe. Chinese communism is interesting because right now uh, China is hyper capitalist. They're, they have all the capitalism in the world with no morality. And they're allowing all this money to come in and trade. They're allowing companies to exist solely to clone products of the West, Sl uh, solely to uh, uh, take copywritten material and make it their own. And for them, that's just business practice. There's no ethos understanding that that's wrong. And that's why we're having so much trouble in trade negotiation to say, taking an American product or a European product and cloning it and selling it cheaper is wrong because that's that's the property rights and the intellectual rights to somebody else and they just not brought up to understand that well how can that be wrong i'm making it cheaper you should like it because it's better and cheaper the quality is still there uh, what are you complaining about the west and these principles that we've had in in the west for you know two thousand years now longer with Ju judeo christian uh Judeo, Judeo influence, sorry, my English is so off today, uh, is not something they, they understand in, in those parts of Asia, George. You're absolutely, absolutely right. I mean, fentanyl is manufactured openly in China, and then it's shipped uh, covertly to Mexico and used to, shipped in the United States and used to kill tens of thousands of people in the opioid epidemic. It's what killing this Chinese fentanyl and the Chinese government knows where it's manufactured. It knows who's manufacturing it. It knows who's making the money. And that's perfectly fine for the Chinese. And here's the funny thing. One of the things I thought was so clever I, about the Ricky Gervais at the Global Glo uh, Golden Globes was that he took Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, was sitting in one of the front row chairs. And he basically makes the joke that, you know, Apple, uh, you use Chinese slave labor and you try to be as pious as all get out. You try to be virtue signal every issue possible. Yet your little machines are made by slave laborers in factories in China. And if you could uh, live stream ISIS, if there was money into it, you'd do it. Yeah, absolutely. And or it's if just, ISIS created their own channel, all the actors would sign up to be actors on it. Yeah, and I think the thing that I'm trying to say is that this absence of morality is not a Chinese phenomenon. No. It's what Ricky Gervais is saying that we see in <laughs> Disney and Apple and Amazon and Microsoft and Google. And, and I think if you would ask all the glitterati at that Golden Globe event, are you, are you guys full of love and joy? and peace they would have smiled at you and said that's us that's absolutely, absolutely us gosh. and then ricky gervais lifts up to them a, a moral ethical mirror in which they're seen completely to fail and that's one of the reasons why using that list of virtues for oneself in a mirror is just inviting an act of self-deception as deep as the one that the hollywood glitterati fell for and we need someone like ricky gervais to stand up and tell us the truth and it ought to be our conscience but if it isn't our conscience we need someone like him and we, we, we find, of course, that in the Gospels. The Gospels set us a standard by which we look at ourselves and we fail. So the wise men need to bring us to Jesus. They didn't bring us to the rest of the other religions, which is what the Church Times silly editorial implied. Gavin, would Ricky Gervais be an anonymous Anglican or Carl Rahner's anonymous Christian? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there are some public figures who tell the truth. And, and because they tell the truth, I, I see them as instruments of, of, of God because uh, we have a wonderful guy called Rod Little in the English uh, journalistic world. And I, I saw him as exercising the same role as St. John the Baptist, basically telling people the truth about themselves and inviting them to repent and to change. I've no doubt at all that God can use anybody, but um, most of the time with, our, with us, we have a great deal of trouble um, sacrificing our wills to him. So uh, it's, you know, what, what, I'm, I'm back to the mage. I bring people to worship Jesus and let the transformation begin. So on this show, uh, we're thinking about ecumenism unscripted. We've gone from the Golden Globes, Chinese communists, uh, Ricky Gervais, uh, Antonio Spadaro, yes. uh, Catherine yeah. Jeffrey Shorey, got, we got our digs into her. Um, 
And Kevin, I just wanted to talk about Indian corruption. And here you no, and no. Gab took in a different direction today. Well, I want to finish up quickly. We got like five minutes. I want to juxtapose uh, the the Methodist split with the the tech split. And we talked about Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, early on, didn't Bishop Peter Lee offer you know? a good deal to the Virginia churches that did not want to uh, uh, continue on uh, with the Episcopal Church. Wasn't there in the early process before the dragon came on scene uh, and her lawyers, wasn't there a, a start to do something like the Methodists did? Yes. And uh, Catherine Jeffrey, Peter Lee openly said he was told he couldn't do this. And at the early parts of the split, but based on the character of the bishop, for instance, in uh, Rio Grande, Jeffrey Steenson, who has unfortunately also become a Catholic, but we won't talk about that, uh, allowed a church. He made an agreement to allow a church to leave without going through the lawsuits to take the property with them. John Howe in Central Florida did this. It was a new plant that had been around for 10, 15 years, and he allowed them to go with their buildings, with their cash, with his blessings. Peter Lee uh, basically made a deal with the Northern Virginia parishes that they could get out in a negotiated settlement. And David Booth Beers, the attorney for Catherine Jefford Shorey, torpedoed that. And she, see Catherine Jefford Shorey, I think as his, as we get farther into the future, we basically see was an instrument of others. She was an instrument of the attorneys. She was an instrument of the hard left. She had her, her words and her views and her, and her point of view, but she was really a tool of deeper forces. Um, but Kevin, you're right. It was torpedoed, and and uh, hopefully the Methodists will avoid the mistake the Episcopal Church made. A mistake, yeah. I mean, axis of evil right there. <clears throat> so let's move on to the next show. Next, let's see. We're gonna do one on Friday, I hope. Right? You got? I like that we discuss our calendars openly in front of our audience. I'm available Friday. What are you doing, George? I'll be here on Friday. <laughs> Gavin, you're not traveling back to England or something Friday, are you? I hope to be on God's side on Friday as well. <laughs> In God's country, too. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I'm going to just finish reading that whole verse. Uh, and his righteousness and all these things and shall be added Gavin, unto I'm you. Gavin, I'm Kevin you. Carlson. And I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been listening to Magi Unscripted on the 7th of January, 2020.